welcome to the TST panel session. Uh, I'm Sang Wuxing from SKT. Okay, uh, so it's really good time to ask any questions about ONOS and any other like SDN. So please prepare any questions. So, okay, so we have some uh, microphone over there. So, go. Okay, so let's start with some introduction. So, can you please introduce a little bit uh, by yourself from maybe uh, John? Yeah. Um, okay, my name is Jonathan Hart. Um, I'm a developer at ONF. I've been working there for uh, almost five years now uh, on Lab and now ONF. Um, and I've been working on the Honors project for about the first three years of that time, um, since before it was open source, and now, now I'm focused mainly on the Cord project, uh, specifically uh, residential Cord. Uh, yeah, but I would like to add that we actually see a lot of contributions from John on the Honors side. Even though they may come in under the Cord umbrella, they're still extremely valuable. Um, you guys met me, I'm Thomas Machuska, I'm the architect for Honors still try to contribute, even though it's less and less these days, because a lot of the time is spent doing code reviews and things like that. Um, I've been working for ONF uh, for the past three years now. I'm, I'm, I'm Yuta Huge from NEC. I've been working with ONOS from like, something like 2015 or something, and basically working mostly in the areas related to the packet protocol and transport side of things. Hi, I'm Brian O'Connor. Uh, was at Owen Lab uh, starting in 2013. Uh, so I've been uh, working there on, on Mininet. Uh, now at the ONF, uh, been with Onos probably around the same amount of time as Chono. And, uh, so uh, yeah, been, been kind of all over the code base. Um, and uh, a lot of the, the work I think that we've been doing is, um, is trying to make sure that the community is successful lately. So. Okay, uh, thank you for your introduction. All right, now we have uh, plenty of time, uh, fortunately. And uh, how many people attended to the last photo spill? Right, a few of them, okay, that's good. Uh, okay. All right, so, uh, so this is a TST panel session. Uh, every, uh, I guess everybody knows what is a TST and uh, what they're doing. But maybe uh, uh, Thomas can introduce uh, a little bit more detail about uh, how what is the role of the TST. Um, sure. So the, the 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 primary role of TST is to to kind of maintain the cohesion of the um, Onos architecture by providing uh, both by sort of providing code reviews and providing uh, design reviews uh, and. Uh, and in general, providing kind of consulting services for when new applications or new functionality is being added to ONOS, just to make sure that it, it adheres to some of the design principle which I, uh, principles which I've outlined earlier, and uh, to make sure that the code base remains clean and sturdy. Um, that's, that's the primary sort of purpose for the TST. All right, thank you. All right, so before you ask some questions, let me ask some common questions to, uh, to all TST members. So please be prepared for your questions. All right, uh, so this is very uh, common questions. So we had like first one of the the last year. So after that, we had the one year has passed. So what do you think was the kind of big achievement or kind of big uh, like, uh, accomplishment? Yeah. So after the last one of the spill? Um, yeah, so I think for me it's um, really looking at the general sort of maturity of the platform, right? I think things are generally progressing um, in a very good way, and, and we can see the software is getting much more uh, stable and mature, and, and this is kind of validated by the fact that we're seeing more and more uh, operators um, and companies interested in deployments, right? So for me, the deployments are, are the best validation that um, you know, the work that we're doing is, is relevant and is, is really being useful to uh, companies in the industry. And so it's really great to, to hear about more and more deployments and, and to see how the, the platform is really maturing towards those. Well, for me, it uh, kind of could be summarized into two different uh, points. One of them is similar to what John mentioned, it's the deployments. Uh, one of them is probably kind of a highlight which we learned recently is that an Austrian company based in Vienna actually used Onos as a platform to develop a solution for managing a traffic network, which is uh, not only, you know, it's safety critical, it's not just a uh, mission critical, it's safety critical network. And the fact that they were able to achieve this 
really almost without any of our knowledge. Uh, we did not learn uh, about this until the network, until the product was put in place, um, and they've contacted us. So that's uh, to me that's a testament that the software is uh, reasonably easy to use, and um, as John mentioned, uh, you know it's getting mature and robust enough to start to be used in such situations. And second point is the, the involvement of the community. We're seeing much more diverse um, uh, involvement from the community members. Uh, and uh, we're seeing this sort of materialized in the notion of the brigades, which was, uh, which you will probably hear echoed throughout, the, throughout, throughout this conference. I think that's a very powerful mechanism for getting a community involved and focus on working on sort of kind of a cohesive fashion on, on some of the important features. Maybe I would say something around. We are starting to see some of the seed of dealing with analytics extra kind of things. Back then, we did sort of have control plane performance metrics in place, but since then, we now have, at least in the optical layer, we have now visibility into the power level thing, which eventually can come back into control loops to optimize the network. And now we have micro semi contributing, starting to contribute, providing metrics about OM performance monitoring. So once we have those performance metrics and a control in place, we will have a finally have a control loop to build for optimized network. So that will be interesting going forward. Cool. Uh, to sort of add to what, what's been said, um, I think platform maturity is extremely important, but uh, from a developer perspective, community maturity is also important. And I think since the last one was built, uh, we've added a, a significant number of module owners. We've seen uh, an increase, a dramatic increase in the number of brigades that we support. Um, from an infrastructure perspective, uh, we're currently in the process of, of moving our infrastructure, which has been uh, sort of ad hocly managed by uh, more or less the, the core team to the Linux Foundation, who's going to provide 24-7 uh, support and scale for the infrastructure. Um, Code-based disaggregation, uh, we haven't uh, necessarily uh, made a tremendous amount of progress yet from a practical perspective, but from a theory perspective, we've made the, the commitments. Um, and, and all of these things help make developers more productive, they help make the community more inviting, uh, they help make the experience more stable for people coming in. Uh, the tutorials from the Teaching Brigade also help uh, ease the, the ramp coming in uh, for new developers. And, and as a result, I think we've, we've probably seen 100, 100 or more new developers on the project, uh, many of whom have been able to, to get to where they are uh, without much help from, from, from uh, individuals, uh, or rather the core team per se. Um, I think the other thing uh, which we've done since uh, last time was built is it's been around uh, looking looking at the future. Um, we've taken dynamic configuration and open config from basically idea to, to something that's working uh, with, with our uh, dynamic config and, and Yang tools. Um, we've introduced support for P4 runtime and P4. Uh, previously, we, we've done some demos using uh, more or less proprietary Thrift API. And we're, we're still looking at you know, making sure that, that OMOS is a platform that is not just ready for your networks today, but ready for the networks uh, of the future. Thank you, yeah. yeah as they say, like, for the last one year, OMOS has been growing like, in terms of community and performance, or like, some like, like, uh, like, uh, technical, uh, technical things. All right, so, so now it's time to take some questions. So if you, if you have any questions, to technical steering team, then please line up and ask any questions. Okay. Uh, just one question. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Great. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Great. So um, I see that you are trying. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, can you please share uh, your name? Ah, okay. I am Michel Santuari. I work in Creative, and I am also an honors ambassador. Uh, so I see that you are trying to disaggregate the code, but my question is, do you think that it's possible to disaggregate the service inside Onos? So that you could have some service that are very close to a specific equipment, and also, for example, I can think, uh, I have like layer 3 device, and I would like to have some specific um, functionality close to my device, and if I lose the connection with all the other services around my cloud, I will still be able to manage such device because I have some basic component very close to the device itself. I don't know if it's clear my question or should I rephrase it? So maybe, maybe I can try to summarize. 
Um, so when we talk about uh, code-based disaggregation, uh, currently what we're talking about is the fact that most of the Onos drivers, applications, and core services are all located in the same Git repository, uh, where the quality of code is fairly high, the, the, the barrier to entry for new developers is, is, is a bit arduous, um, but where, uh, where we're trying to go is we're trying to, to move to a, a more disaggregated model from a, re, a repository perspective. Um, the question you're asking is more about, uh, we have this notion of a tightly coupled control cluster. Can we break up the cluster yeah, exactly. uh, either through federation mechanisms or through um, some sort of hierarchy uh, such that you can have um, different Onos clusters uh, or even Onos instances that are separate from, from, from the main cluster. And I think we've seen a few different efforts. Um, there's, there's one effort around um, using uh, gRPC for some remote uh, intent uh, processing um, for the, the eCourt uh, case. So I think the, the eCourt example is probably, probably the best one, and maybe Yuto wants to, to talk more about that. Ah, uh, yes. So, yeah, for, in the eCourt case, is a little bit unique. Oh, we, we, I guess no hands, we haven't been to the core use case in the first place, but it's kind of hard to articulate what the difference about e code is that e code needs to orchestrate multiple sites, so we definitely need some type of, some form of federation, but that, that we don't want to expose the whole detail of the, the, each site into the global orchestration to make the decision, so we will need to provide some level of abstraction up above, and that is the kind of thing that e code is currently working on. Now, it's not really generalized application yet, but uh, Francesco the, in, in the audience there has built recently built an application that will give you the big switch view of a central office and populate that information up above so that the overarching uh, controller can do the global task computation, stitching multiple central office together, controlling them one. That's the kind of things we are exploring right now. Okay. Yeah. And just to approach it from a slightly different direction, um, there's, there's also this notion of um, you know, many, many sort of applications or use cases, uh, things are proactively provisioned for the most part, but then there's this, this sort of reactive handling that needs to be happening, right? For one, one good example of this is uh, answering ARC requests, and often the controller is involved with the, the packets are coming up to the controller, the controller is um, figuring out what's the, uh, the, the right um, you know, answer to give back to the host and, and send it back. Um, but there's really no reason why this can't be pushed down to the device itself, right? Um, because it's always the same thing. If an app request for a given target generally has the same answer. Um, so, you know, the, we've talked about this notion of being able to push some of this, some of this reactive processing uh, down to the device and have that handle it by itself without any of the controller being involved. Um, and what that means is that um, you, have, you actually have much better sort of uh, uh, resiliency, right? If, if you lose connection to your control cluster entirely, then um, the devices can still handle things like ARC requests or DHCP requests and things like that. So. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you for your questions. So, answers. Uh, anybody, any, uh, if you prefer Korean, then please use Korean. I'm so good at speaking Korean, so. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so probably, uh, yeah. Then, <clears throat> okay, just in case I have prepared some more questions to you guys, okay. So please be prepared here for uh, questions during this um, next question. Okay, so let me ask some next common questions. So, uh, uh, you guys have been like involving uh, building like uh, almost for three years, like four years, right? So what was kind of the biggest hurdle, or what was kind of biggest challenge so far? Um, I think one of the hardest parts of Onus is, is really the distributed core, right? I mean, that, that's, that's um, you know, one of the, some of the most um, hardest challenges in all of computer science, right? So um, getting, getting those questions right and figuring out, um, you know, what are the right kind of storage mechanisms, what kind of state needs to be stored um, in, in different kind of storage mechanisms, what kind of consistency you need. I think um, figuring out those kind of questions has been one of the the, the central kind of architectural uh, problems with, uh, you know, within the entire Onus project. So, yeah. I mean, I think another another big area, um, especially when we started, has been um, hardware support. Um, so 
you know, software developers, we like to have, you know, emulators and models for doing development. Uh, we've had Mininet for, for years. Um, we've continued to have uh, a wide variety of, of really high quality software switches, um, which have enabled us to do a tremendous amount of development and make a tremendous amount of progress. But one of the things um, that we're just starting to see now uh, is this uh, general availability of, of high quality switches. Um, and so I would say that that probably has been more or less, it's, it's not so much an architectural hurdle, but more or less a, a, a reality that's prevented us from, from deployment um, prior to maybe maybe one year ago. So, um, yeah, I would say that, that that for me has been uh, been a consistent. Right. Thanks. From my viewpoint, if I can add to it, I guess it's been striking the balance between um, the simplicity of the abstractions uh, um, without oversimplifying them too much, because clearly if you, uh, once you define the abstractions, they're somewhat fixed, uh, because if you mutate them too much, then you don't have any backwards compatibility. So once you fix them, then um, you're kind of stuck at being able to do just those sorts of things, whereas uh, you know, a lot of devices expose a lot of unique features, and so the heterogeneity of the devices, balancing the heterogeneity of devices with homogeneity of the APIs, that's been a little bit of a, um, a, bit of a challenge. You know? uh, we clearly, time will tell how well we've done, uh, so far, so good, but um, but time will tell. Yeah. Right? Okay. So, uh, any questions? Great. Yep. Go ahead. Yep. Thanks. And please start your with your name and organization. Hello, uh, I'm Afaq Mohammad. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at. Cheju National University. Uh, we are actually working on uh, MCOR end to end slicing. Uh, I'm not sure whether this question is related to this session or not, but uh, we were wondering if there is any open source or generalized app for the sl slicing the RAM part through like owners and open flow protocol. All right. So the, just to repeat, just to make sure I understand the question. Yes. So the question is, is there any open source uh, app? Like slicing app? Slicing the RAM, right? Yes, yes. Um, I, I honestly don't know. So with, with ONOS, uh, we, we talk about virtualization uh, brigade. Um, and and so, so it could be, um, it could be conceived clearly that the, the, the ONOS virtualization uh, mechanism could be used for this purpose, but actually, upon closer look, when we've had discussions with uh, with uh, MCORD architect like us, um, we sort of realized that even though the virtualization does provide reason regenerate mechanism for virtualization, it really does not meet some of the stringent requirements that MCORD has with respect to be able to really carve out and reserve certain uh, resource availability. Um, of that virtual network in the underlay, and so, um, so we're still uh, we're still trying to figure out what is the best mechanism. Uh, right now, the thought is that the best mechanism for providing the slicing is actually going to be met by the Travis application, um, and, and for that, you would have to probably get more details from Sorov, who's, uh, who's um, kind of the principal on the on the Travis application. But in terms of external open source uh, mechanisms, I honestly don't know of any. This is the closest uh, within the realm of one of the code base that I can give you an answer for. Thank you very much. And actually, yeah, I was uh, working on MCOD a little bit, so I can answer maybe it might be pessimist or not. But actually, MCOD is a little bit different from the other area of like R code and E code because MCOD is kind of for a mobile uh, telco operator. And then MCOD requires a lot of kind of um, uh, like a VF, like EPC or MMU, or something. Uh, those are not really easy, like simple uh, VFs. So, so there are many like uh, telco vendors for uh, to to for uh, commercialization. So it's really difficult to you know to to actually to make the real network slicing. We need we need to have kind of a uh, like a, a VPC, VMM, or VIMS, or something. But actually, it's very difficult to open such a source code. Uh, I'm not sure, maybe if, like, I know that Redis is, is trying to do something, but maybe if it's open, it's too complicated to see or to maintain. So, probably a little bit, uh, it will take 
a little bit more time to like to see some open source of real you know M code use cases. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right. So any next questions? Okay, great. Hi, uh, my name is Kanta Yamamoto. I work for Fujitsu. Mm -hmm. I have two questions. Uh, one is, uh, uh, well, I feel uh, the throughput of the uh, the instance, uh, which is created in uh, VMs or containers, I'm not sure which it is, but the uh, throughput would be poor. Uh, it's my personal impression. Uh, is there any uh, activities you think you need for getting more performance? The second question is... Um, okay, but that's one question. <laughs> so, so, just a clarification before you leave, right? I may, we may need more data. So, right. throughput of what? Is it flow, flow operations or intent uh, operations or... Okay. Yes. instance running inside the servers or so my my understanding is uh, some controllers or um, on the sun it's like audio or something mm -hmm. I, yeah. so do you are, are you talking about like uh, performance comparison between like audio or view or something and all this um, speaking of the uh, residential code VCB uh, is implemented in the container, but I'm not sure the performance throughput of its instance is good enough for uh, real. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. So there are several techniques you can use to kind of get the the best kind of higher performance um, when you're going you know, from the network through to the CPU based functions. Um, one of one of the most common ones is the Intel's DPDK, right, which gives you um, very, very fast uh, uh, you know, line rate um, ability to move data in and out of the, of the network card. Um, so there's been a lot of work recently, specifically in our code, um, about using DPDK um, with the VCPU to, to really improve the performance there. Um, and, and then I guess the, looking forward, there's, there's also these ideas of um, being able to move some of that functionality into the hardware itself, right? As we get more and more capable hardware um, and more programmability of that hardware through things like P4, um, then it may become possible to actually take these functions that right now we're running you know, on, as containers on x86 and, and move them into this programmable hardware. Um, so, you do, so you really do have a fast path uh, entirely in the network. So, so, so some, some, fun, some, so some functions won't move to the hardware like in P4. So I found some uh, activities that uh, yeah. forming gateway functions going to move to the switch, P4 switch, right? And so I wonder that the, uh, some functions which need throughput going to the hardware not in the server side. Is it what you're going to take for getting stupid? So I guess you mean kind of uh, like uh, some uh, leak of or something like right? hardware floating of uh, OBS function, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so actually I've been working on also some data plane explanation. So we've been looking at some DPDK, as, uh, as Jono said. Also there are, there are some smart leaks. Smart leak. Uh, that offloads the entire OBS function. Also, recently, like Intel has announced kind of a Xeon and MPGA board, right? Also, we are doing some kind of a you know, POC with them. But still, it's I think it's still early stage. Then I'm not really sure if we can really utilize it. Um, but but uh, of course, the vendor says that it's already commercialized. But still, I can. Um, my feeling is that it is far from some commercialization. Uh, in terms not not because of the hardware, it's because of software. So we need, I think we need some more like progress on the uh, driver and software or something, yeah. And I, I know that the Samsung guys is kind of an expert of, of DPDK, so if you have any uh, uh, good proper answer, if you can answer it, then please just uh, uh, raise your hand and you can answer to, uh, to that question. Any? 
All right, so still we have a plenty of time. So do we have any um, questions? No? Nope. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Maybe. <laughs> Thank you, finally. <laughs> Hello, hello, I'm David from the ONF. So I have two questions, and the first maybe uh, uh, Sengo you can answer, but Guru earlier talked about the great contributions the Korean community has made, so I'm just curious uh, to hear from um, maybe you or other people from the community, how did that community come together and, and you know, what was it that helped form, you know, the community here? Because I'm curious, because we want to replicate the great work that community is doing in other parts of the world, like how do we build a community like that somewhere else? So I'd be really interested to hear about how it all came together. And then for the TST, you know, you just went through the roadmap and there was a lot of stuff there. Like if you had just one or two things that are top of mind, what would you love to see the Korean community help with most? Like of everything on the roadmap, like what on there is most, you know, pressing? <clears throat> okay, so community. Okay, so William, do you have something to say? Or? That's for you. Okay, so for me, I think. <laughs> yeah, okay, so yeah, uh, actually, yeah, in Korea, uh, Jiang Lee, he's kind of a leader of um, or the almost called uh, Korean uh, developer community. So we have uh, built, so we have kind of, uh, we started our almost called community for last year. So we are like doing like a bi monthly workshop. Uh, so also uh, the STN NAP forum is supporting us. Thank you. Um, and also we have like around 30 people are really actively, actively working on that, um, uh, our uh, almost called uh, Korean developer community. And we are, sh we are kind of uh, um, giving a uh, like talk about, we are sharing our experience on the use cases and what we are really doing in our company and our, some, uh, our some institutions, like right? some KIST or also uh, KAIST or GIST, they really working on, um, on us very uh, actively. Yeah, so we are all working on very well. I think maybe our Korean uh, honors community is kind of, uh, I think, uh, it's the best uh, community in the world, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so, and the second question? Yeah, um, so I think for me, one of the things that's most pressing or, or most interesting on the roadmap is the, um, is the GRPC APIs, right? Um, so this, this will give us the ability to run um, most of the applications off-platform, right? Right now, most of applications are actually injected into the same JVM as, as the Onos core. Um, and that kind of leaves us a little bit vulnerable. Um, if an application were to misbehave or, or to malfunction, um, then it can, it can also affect uh, other parts of the system. Um, so I think it, you know, in terms of moving forward into, into deployments and things like that, it'd be, it'd be really great if we were able to have these you know, high bandwidth off-platform applications um, that you know, have a high bandwidth inter interface with, with the core and, and can do their work uh, you know, in their own process or in their own container. Um, and this also gives you much more flexibility in how, in how you deploy these things. Um, you don't have to have everything in one place. You can kind of split applications up, uh, deploy them where you want, and, and then kind of scale them as, as you want as well. Um, so for me, that's one of the most interesting things going forward. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Yeah. The, the support for gRPC is probably, even though it's something that's been in incubation for a couple of different releases right now, uh, I'd really like to see it, especially in Magpie, to start to materialize in, uh, in some um, sort of visible way. Because not only for offloading applications, um, but also ultimately to disaggregate, disaggregating the ONOS score itself, which I think was actually part of a question that Nikola asked in the beginning. Uh, is how will it to be able to disaggregate the, the, the honors process itself um, and without hopefully repeating too much of what John just said I mean this will allow, allow us to deploy things and you know, sort of support service scaling so that you, have, you know you may have different parts of the system that are loaded much more than others and this would allow you to instantiate different things plus also it would add something that honors is currently really ill-suited for which is uh, running tenant-specific applications because of the lack of, I mean, we do have some isolation capabilities, but they're uh, limited compared to traditional networking, uh, you know, operating systems, uh, is to provide uh, better isolation mechanisms so that you can have a co-compatible 
uh, to be able to uh, run the same instance of an application without necessarily being in, in back on each other. Uh, right now, we really can't do that very well. It's not about specific robot algorithm or something, but what I would like to see from community is that more people who actually are using hands-on, using the tool to give us more feedback in general. In the past, the BPLS was really went really well in a way that they, people who were actually running the network were involved in the process how they would like to see that the CLI and user interface to change over time and that greatly improved the usability of the, how the configuration were part of the structure, part of the CLI the structure. So having the user in the loop of the development process really helps getting the really tangible usable application. So we would like to see more and more people speaking up about what their experience, how they want, what kind of improvement they would like to see, that, that kind of thing we would like to see. Well, so let me just highlight two, two current initiatives that are going on in Korea, and maybe uh, they'd, be, they'd be good initiatives to join. Um, the first, which uh, Jono and Thomas both mentioned, the gRPC stuff, is actually led by uh, Jian Li, who uh, sang mentioned earlier. Um, they're, they're an active brigade that's currently working on making, making gRPC interfaces available northbound, eastbound, westbound, etc. Um, the other initiative is the virtualization brigade that's been mentioned a few times. Um, that's led by Yunsun, who's now uh, Samsung. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that would be another good local brigade uh, to join as well. Um, I think from, from my perspective, uh, the, 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 the personal challenge that I would, would offer to the community, um, Korea is known for uh, being an early adopter and having uh, new hardware, new devices. And um, I think putting that hardware to good use, um, getting, getting experience with deployments on, on things like P4 switches, next-gen open-flow switches, um, et cetera. Um, if those things can go into trials and, and that feedback can be, can be given back to the community and, and code contributions, uh, drivers, uh, new applications, et cetera, um, for, for the new hardware, I'd, I'd really I look forward to seeing that. Right, thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> any more questions? Okay, great. Uh, this is Lee from Intel Live and from you know SNNI Freebie Forum. Yeah, I'm working with that. And um, I thought it, the TST means testing. I'm <laughs> 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 really interested about the right. testing or the quality of the design effect. So the OINOS probably the um, distribute so for many times on a year, so four or three, six, I'm not sure, but would you yeah, like to give you any opinion about the, the quality of the ONS? That effect is some, yeah, that is a very simple question, but, but would you provide? It's like in terms of like commercial grade quality, right? Yeah, and I'm quality, and I'm, uh, and then about yeah, testing. Mm -hmm. So very, um, I think about a short time to uh, the time you know the gap gap of the distribution, but but probably the yeah, brigade some to brigade brigade the yeah, testing about things. I see. Yeah. Probably can, yeah, I mean, maybe you can answer how we can you know, like, uh, the the guarantee the quality of the quality of sure. I mean it's definitely a good question, right? Um, so, to guard for good quality of the code, it's a kind of a multi-stage effort. Um, first of all, we do engage in sort of manual code reviews to, to make sure the code uh, adheres to certain certain style and certain philosophy of design, uh, just to make it more maintainable uh, and so that it kind of looks as if it was written by the same author, even though there may be 200 people writing the code. Um, that's kind of visual aesthetic uh, enforcement. Um, then there's of course unit tests, which we, you know, we were um, encouraging and asking for community contribute contribute unit tests. Um, uh, now, having said that, our code coverage has dropped uh, since the kind of I think like second release. I think we were probably uh, 50 plus uh, code coverage. I think right now we're at 40 and we would like to eventually actually get to higher code coverage. 
Of course, you know, generally we would like to have code, have code coverage through unit tests for across all types of functionality, but some are clearly more critical than others, like the distributed code, it clearly needs to be extremely well unit tested. Um, driver code, maybe not so much, um, but you know, that's a little bit of a subjective assessment. Uh, but clearly unit tests are extremely important. Um, we also have uh, QA within ONF. Um, there's a group that tests uh, the different releases um, using their system tests. And we also have uh, kind of modular developer-oriented scenario tests, uh, which we call STC, uh, that developers can use to run in their own environments to just be able to basically make sure that the system continues to operate. And the STC tests are something that we're also now running on our Jenkins machine periodically, but we would eventually like to also make it part of the Gary validation build so that as a developer submits the code, the, the code will not only run all of the check style and unit tests, but also run the system test to make sure that something was not broken in almost runtime by those changes. Um, those are just a couple, couple of different tiers. Uh, you know, of course, uh, the diff we've had different members of the community also run their own test scenarios. For example, I know that CNI is running their own set of test suites uh, somewhere else, and they do end up reporting number of defects and fixing number of defects, both in the current master as well as some of the past releases that they're supporting. And um, you know, there's clearly more work to be done, but yes, quality is extremely important. Okay, thank you. So actually, the uh, code quality and the guaranteed, uh, guaranteed quality of the house is also the law of our community, actually. So even though they are in charge of kind of uh, the, the owner's core of the code quality, but actually they can really review all of the, you know, the, the application's code. So we should really test more when we unload our codes. Yeah. I'm trying to do that, but I know, I know it's not really hard. But. Okay, so, uh, all right, so while you are preparing the next question, so um, I prepared this situation, so I've done some research. Uh, can you please show uh, Japanese slides of the so I have done some uh, small, very tiny, tiny uh, research. Uh, so uh, I know uh, everybody knows that SKT is very AI, you know, the intensive uh, company. So uh, using our AI facility, I've analyzed uh, like our almost uh, email mailing list. I have analyzed like 10,000 mailing list, mailing list, and I have uh, uh, created some kind of word cloud. Is it like uh, upside down? I think. But anyway, still, <laughs> yeah, I think it's upside down, still, it's okay. So, I, but actually, I have analyzed only the, the subject of the email. So, so, in the center, also we have big honors, of course. So, now we can see what is kind of a main, like, focus, or, 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 so I, like, uh, uh, what is kind of a uh, main, main, like, the concerns, main questions, main, like, you know, some from the community. Uh, so we can see some flows and devices, intent, some clusters, optical, and a lot of things. Uh, can you please sh uh, sh the next uh, go to sh show the next one? Okay. So now I have picked 100 keywords. And still we have honors, bug, intents, flow, driver, device, build. So so if you have any, you can you can like pick any keyword from here. Uh, that means like. It's not your only concern. So everybody is interested in this kind of keyword. So you can you can use this keyword when you ask questions. So okay. So let me pick one question, one 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 keyword from here. So actually, I've been working on also developing Sona, and I'm trying to you know I'm a little bit like huddling. I'm having some trouble uh, trouble with clustering of uh, Sona. So I'm gonna pick some cluster keyword. So I know that it's really difficult to implement the cluster. So can, can you please share the uh, is what's, what what is kind of a big challenge or big hurdle to you know build a kind of a completely uh, distributed system? And what is kind of a, a roadmap? What is kind of a, how to, how you are trying to improve this kind of clustering system? Is it too difficult? Right. <laughs> 
I mean, that's, I, I think I understand the question, you know, but I just want to make sure I, I don't talk to, to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Want to take it? Okay. So, so I think there's there's two parts to the clustering challenges, right? One of the parts of the clustering challenges is historically it's been difficult to build distributed systems, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe I'll, I'll let someone else take that part. But the other part to clustering is that um, it requires a, a network that has been configured to work together. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that, that almost works is that you provide a cluster JSON and a partitions JSON uh, that need to be aware of IP addresses, need to, need to have some, some management network, um, and it, it needs, they're, they're, depending upon your deployment scenario, uh, there are different uh, mechanisms and ways that you need to, to build this thing. Um, there have been some improvements that we've, we've tried. Uh, we've, we've made it possible to automatically generate uh, SSA, uh, SSL keys um, for doing secure communication between the cluster nodes, um, but there, there's still some opportunity around if Honos is going to be run in specific environments, if it's going to be run in Docker or Kubernetes, right. Um, right. making the uh, process of deploying a cluster more automated. Um, we, we don't really have uh, as much of that today. Um, so, so I think that there's definitely an opportunity from an ease of use and bootstrapping perspective to make to make some enhancements. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, if there's people people here that are that are using specific types of deployment scenarios uh, or orchestrators, um, you're, we definitely welcome uh, some contribution to, to contribute uh, scripts or, um, or, uh, or certain rule sets uh, around, around that. So, so quick clarification for the question. So uh, at least I, as I understood it originally, you asked it was, so there's the deployment of the cluster aspect, which is what That's right, yeah. Right. But there's also some um, the internal aspect of developing an application which is itself distributed and how it almost facilitates it. Did you also have that in mind as part uh, of the question? Yeah, actually I was in mind a little bit more on the deployment. Okay. But still, I can also, you also you can answer that was a question. Like, you know, well, well, that's fine. I, wanna <laughs> I don't want to make a question. I just want to make sure that, that the, the question that you asked was, was fully answered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, and, and so to add to what Brian said on the internal aspect, deployment right. aspect, I mean, there's definitely changes already being made. We recognize the fact that uh, that there is some um, manual kind of work required to properly configure the, the, the cluster and the partitions uh, if you want to do it in a non-standard way, and, and especially when it comes to the, uh, supporting dynamic clustering, that then becomes really apparent that if you add non nodes to the cluster and don't change the partitions that are, or, or change it badly, uh, no, at the, okay, at the very best, you're going to end up with something that's not, uh, not, not doesn't really necessarily increase your scalability as you add new nodes. But at the very worst, you could potentially break the cluster uh, or, or even lose the information that you already have by misconfiguring going forward. Basically, the cluster will dissemble. And so, uh, clearly, to prevent that matter scenario, we, we are adding tools to be able to uh, seamlessly scale the number of partitions as you add nodes. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, do you have any uh, additional question? All right. Great. Oh, we two. Okay. This, my name is Shiva. I'm from Samsung. So, uh, this question is related to cluster only. Uh, like right now, uh, if you have a three node cluster, it requires uh, two nodes to be active for the cluster to function. Like if one goes down, it can work. But if two nodes goes down, then it will. I understand like there is some dependency with the underlying protocol that is being used for this. Like in future, is there any plan like even in three node cluster, if two node goes down, still the cluster can function? That is my first question. Second question is related to like, what is the plan for this uh, in-service software upgrade? Like in which release uh, you are, uh, I mean, that will be available and what will be the status? So I'm going to hopefully briefly ask, answer and then let others add. So to answer the first question, um, we really don't have any plans to add support of, uh, for two con cascading failures to one of three nodes. If you want to support two simultaneous nodes failing, you need to be able to add five. You basically need to be able to have five nodes in a cluster and that will get you the, the required level of resiliency. So that's just a brief uh, question to that part. Uh, on ISSU, um, the, 
the idea is to add this functionally incrementally, as Ian has mentioned before. So we started by adding ability to the of the two nodes in the cluster who are running two different versions of the software to be able to communicate with each other, which is the portable civilization. But that alone is not enough. We also need to be able to, uh, if the stores themselves, stores are stores are the primary mechanism through which the information is disseminated and tracked across the cluster. So, so the stores themselves, if they change in some sort of deep semantic way, they need to themselves have logic that can deal with two different versions. So, so and potentially even applications that operate on a network or, or subsystems that operate a network need to be able to recognize that they're in the middle of an upgrade and not uh, engage in any changes on the, uh, on the network. And so there is actually a detailed proposal for how the protocol works. Uh, the idea is to offload as much of the burden of applications as possible, but some participation of the applications will be required to support the ISS unit. I was just going to add to the first part of the question. Um, that's, uh, you know, having three node cluster only supporting one failure is not just a limitation of on us. It's, it's actually pretty common across many distributed systems, especially ones that rely on having a majority of nodes to be active to, to, in order to write to the cluster. Um, and in, in those kind of systems, you need, uh, basically to support n failures, you need two n plus one nodes. So um, if you want to support one failure, you need three nodes. If you want to support two failures, you need five nodes. And so, it's about choosing um, how many failures you want to support and then choosing the appropriate number of nodes uh, based on that. So just um, to, to, to maybe confuse things a bit, um, not intentionally, but maybe, maybe that will happen. Um, Onos has a, a, a few different types of, of stores and, and really um, the, the failures of two nodes um, in a three node cluster will only really impact the strongly consistent stores. Um, and so in, in the strongly consistent stores, uh, you may be familiar with the cap theorem. Uh, in the face of partition tolerance, you can have consistency or availability. For, strong, uh, for the strongly consistent stores, we choose consistency. And so without a majority of nodes available, uh, you can't make forward progress on strongly consistent stores. Onos also has a notion though of uh, more loosely consistent or eventually consistent stores. Um, these stores can continue to operate, sort of, in the face of, uh, of, of uh, a, a majority of the nodes going down. Uh, they can't elect new leaders for timestamps, but for making updates to partitions or to, to pieces of the store that already exist, uh, they can continue to take reads and writes. Um, the other thing is that from like a driver perspective, if, for example, you pushed, you know, arc rules down to the driver and had the driver just, you know, res respond with arcs or something, um, individual nodes, the individual node in the cluster that's still up could continue to respond um, without having to do distributed operations in the face of those failures. But there's things like mastership handover that, in the face of two failures, you wouldn't be able to hand the mastership over of devices that were under, under the other system. Um, so if you have like a real-time application uh, that you do actually care about availability more than consistency, it's important that um, you're using, uh, or you've at least cached information locally on that node uh, that would not necessarily require consistent store reads or writes uh, to make forward progress. And then hopefully these, these failures are somewhat transitive, uh, transient, and that when the nodes come back, uh, you'd be able to, to synchronize with the rest of the cluster. Thank you. Uh, can I ask one more question? Sure. It's regarding uh, data center interconnectivity. Uh, like uh, in the industry standard, uh, protocols like uh, BGP, VXLAN, VPN uh, is a de facto standard nowadays. Like, so, but I don't see much information in Kronos with respect to VPN uh, protocol. How we achieve it? Uh, we have like east west communication in place, but. Uh, the overall picture is not quite clear as to how we can achieve DCA. Thank you. Yeah, so um, uh, that's an area that there's been a team um, uh, from Huawei and a team from Tech Mahindra that have been working on BGP-based EVPNs um, over the past year or so. 
and that code is very recently being contributed to R. So I think it wasn't available in the previous release, but it is available in the, the release that just went out, uh, 1.11. Um, so there now is capability within RNOS to be able to support uh, BGP eVPNs. Um, and the hope was that we could leverage that <coughs> same uh, code to support other types of VPNs, L3 VPNs, and, and things like that. Um, so yeah, that's really a recent addition to the RNOS code base. Plus also, there's also some activity around MEF, more top-down approach of providing the end-to-end -end, uh, VPN services, which we are trying to adapt in the equal use case. So you, I think you'll be able to hear more about that in, on this Friday talk by Francesco. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And maybe I remember Frank. Okay, go ahead. Hello, I'm from Wang. I'm from China. Uh, so uh, I have uh, two questions. Uh, the first is um, I don't know if it is uh, uh, right, if it is right. But I feel uh, in China, in my company, and uh, uh, my leader heard the uh, audio. Then who knows? Do we have a more active uh, uh, marketing policy? Um, uh, can we organize more activities uh, like some uh, uh, meetup? Uh, so uh, in some times I have to always, I have to do many times to um, explain ex, uh, explain 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 why we uh, why do we use all those hard. So I, I know uh, I know uh, all those are very good, but uh, uh, I I feel uh, the um, it's a uh, uh, marketing policy is not uh, very uh, very, uh, very uh, uh, good. I think uh, it's a, it's a, a not a technical technical question. So I just. Uh, 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 put up uh, uh, from here. I see. So maybe the question is simple: Why or us? Right? <laughs> uh, no, no, no. I think uh, I know uh, all those is very good. Uh, I uh, we do a lot of uh, in investigation between audio and all those, uh, and uh, we I uh, I think all those are very good, but. Uh, I mean, uh, but uh, some some guys they they they, uh, they do not uh, they they don't call in. They uh, they heard um, a lot of uh, audio is not uh, on those. So I think uh, uh, can we <laughs> do uh, some uh, promotion or, or about on those? Uh, in, I, I mean, so no, it's, it's so. It's, Less of a question and more of a suggestion, and if I understood correctly, <laughs> yeah. uh, and not necessarily a technical one, but more, uh, I think what I heard you say was that you would like to see more events like hackathons or meetups that are almost related to increase ONOS's visibility, at least as a relative to open daylight. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. And it's certainly something that, uh, you know, we're, uh, as part of the ONOS building, Community building, we're looking at doing is in, add more hackathons, more region um, based meetups. But that's something that the almost ambassador community is working with, and I'll let you add to that. Sorry. 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 Sure, sure, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, William. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know you're on the spot. Thanks, Tom. Um, actually, uh, I wanted the ambassador program is actually a really critical piece to your question or answer to your question because uh, absolutely we uh, we actually we need to do much more in, in in China and other parts of the world to really to organize events or hackathons and bring the community together. There are a lot of people who are very interested in Ono who want to get involved, but we maybe we need to support local community uh, more. And so the ambassador program is a very uh, very effective program so far to really support uh, our communities around the world. And I know that we have about 10 ambassadors in China. 
Uh, a 10 sounds, uh, it's like a big number for us, but it's maybe not so much to China. China's a big country. <laughs> China's a big country. <laughs> big country. Uh, but yes, but one suggestion or one question not that you can think about you know, during Ono's build is how can we uh, articulate Ono's and how can we, uh, what can be our, our, our message, uh, how can we have a better message in China to uh, reach out to uh, local developers and, and people interested or who could be interested in Ono's. And the other thing, another important point is uh, for whoever is on WeChat, uh, we have an Ono's WeChat group and yeah. we have about 400 people on the Onos WeChat group. So clearly a lot of people are very interested. Unfortunately, my Chinese is not very good. It's, it's actually not existent. Uh, but so we really need, you know, we would really need to know or try to engage with that group. And I know there's some conversations in that group, but I wish I could, if I could speak Chinese, I could really reach out to them. But anyway, something to think about is how can we, and especially David and myself, or the community managers at Open Networking Foundation, how can we support that group to really start uh, promoting ONOS and organize more events and, and meetups in, in China? Yes, thanks. So here is another question. So many, peop uh, many people in China are very interested in uh, ONOS, but uh, they have, uh, it's difficult to contribute something. So here is a request for TST. Can we figure, try to figure out uh, uh, some way uh, to uh, to have to, uh, you know in China something is uh, blocked. I uh, I uh, often meet the, um, miss those those things. You know uh, when I can download some package, I should take a few days to figure the why why I can download something. <coughs> so can we? This is a problem. <laughs> uh, I have talked to David and uh, Camelo and uh, Brian. So, uh, uh, I'm thinking, uh, can we provide some mirror or, I don't know, uh, if we also try to figure it out, I think I can uh, provide some suggestions or can help. Thank you. All right, thank you for your question. So I think uh, you don't need query, you don't need query, so right? So, right, <laughs> right. Anyway, yeah, um, thank you for, do you have anything to mention? Yeah, um, so I think we've had these kind of problems in the, on the court side as well uh, recently. Um, and, you know, one, one of the things, I mean, I mean this, this kind of stuff is very hard for us to even know what the problems are because we're not in China and, and we're not kind of trying to use the software over there. So, so one, of the, one of the things is that you guys who, who are over there, um, if you figure out ways to, to work around it or to build things that don't work out of the box, then um, we should definitely document that and get those things on the wiki. Um, I know that um, uh, when, when trying to build the code stuff in China, there was um, they had to use different uh, uh, Maven variants instead of the, the US-based ones. They had to use Chinese ones because uh, the US-based one, ones were blocked. Um, so things like that. Um, if it's just a, a matter of kind of changing the configuration or, or adding different variants or things like that, then that should really be documented, and we should get that on the wiki so that uh, you know people are able to, to do this without having to like figure it all out themselves. And for for almost specifically. Um, I mean, we started as having uh, the only requirement was to be able to clone the, the, the repo and then you should be able to build it, um, provided you have access to the main and central, um, which was at least uh, reasonably redirectable. Um, but right now we've added, uh, uh, most recently we've added a couple of dependencies, you're probably are familiar with them. One of them is on NPM, access to the NPM repos, and one is on, on, on Git, uh, be able to download something for, from GitHub. And um, which kind of jeopardizes the offline builds uh, because the, the access to those repos is not really is required to be live during the build process, and that's something that we would like to remedy. The idea is that uh, it might be required uh, once, but once it's cached, then you should be able to run the build offline in kind of an offline mode, uh, which is something that you can't do today. So we'll probably have to fix that, hopefully in Magpie release, if not in an end release. Yeah, thank you. And <clears throat> now it's one more question. Yeah, Christopher, wait. Okay, wait. 
Okay, I'm Justin from Entry, and uh, I'm very new to Onos, but I've been working on ODL for a couple of years. <laughs> and my question is, Onos didn't support Yang and NetConf in the beginning, but now it does. So I want to know the design choice, the history or story behind supporting Yang and NetConf. So first of all, welcome from the dark. <laughs> welcome from the dark side. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, and, and second, um, so um, as I mentioned in, in the talk earlier, actually on the support the configuration from fairly early on, uh, because there's nothing to say that the only way to do configuration is through Yen, um, and and that's really the netconf. Uh, but of course, we recognize that that is a, a fairly popular ways of uh, configuring devices, and so we wanted to add um, a support for for developers to be able to do that. Um, the reason it's been kind of a little bit late is because there was really no good choice for Yang tools that were uh, for Java that were independent of platform. Because if you've worked on ODL, you probably are aware that, that the ODL tool that the ODL Yang tool chain is fairly tied to ODL, at least to MB sound. And that's clearly not something that we could just blanketly import into ONOS. And so we made the choice to develop our own Yang, um, Yang tool chain to be able to support at least initially ONOS, uh, sort of Yang 1.0. And it was a fairly long process, uh, but uh, we managed to do that, and, and, and we managed to do it in a way which actually the ONOS Yang tools are completely independent of ONOS, both at compile time and runtime. So you can actually use uh, those tools completely outside of context of ONOS. So they're, even though they carry ONOS in the name, they're really actually generic Yang tools. And they produce um, Java artifacts, uh, which allow you to both in a model agnostic and model specific way to build up the information model in memory and then to be able to serialize it into and from XML or JSON at runtime. And so, so we were a little late in that regard to the game, but uh, we're there now. Uh, so what we're still trying to add, which is something that we don't have and where ODL is still ahead, is the ability to store the information in this unified tree store which can, you know, ODL has MB sound. So Honos is building something similar to allow applications to be built without having to build their own stores and track their own the information that they import into Honos uh, in this centralized tree store. And uh, I will add Utah, I will let Utah add to it on the device synchronization, <laughs> right? Because that's something that we're working on. Yeah. So yeah. Like, just a part of transmission. So the dynamic configuration subsystem is effectively going to be the store where you can store whatever Yang data structure into it. Now, the little bit different thing is that so Yang itself defines an API, so there the, is a little bit of a challenge in trying to incorporate that into a global tree since those are defined as an API for a device versus what almost as a whole. We are talking about the whole network, so we need a, some level similar adapting that into some subset of things. So we are currently working on the mechanics to build that thing, and we are trying to come up with an initial version that can speak NetConf down to the device so that whatever you, anywhere in the network, you can write request for some configuration about a device, and you will really synchronize down to the device. That's mm -hmm. something we are hopefully deliver in the MacPy or the version next. And, and one last bit, which maybe is the history part which you asked about. <laughs> um, and, and I think the, the, the reason why Onos didn't have NetConf Yang to begin with is because Onos, uh, sort of at its roots, was a, a, a controller around the, the notion of SDN as a separation of data plane and control. And so for control plane offloading, um, <laughs> open flow and, and flow programming abstractions were much more important to us then the ability to configure BGP, ISIS, configure you know, all of these, uh, these existing networking protocols. And so ODL, on the, other, on the other hand, kind of has more roots in, in configuration automation, uh, where taking the existing devices that you have and, and doing configuration um, to those devices was, was more important. And so you know, obviously, there is some degree of configuration that's required in 
in, uh, in, in doing network control. You need to bring ports up. You need to uh, establish some protocols for communication of devices that are legacy devices or, or devices that are going to communicate uh, outside of, of your uh, autonomous system or, or network that's under your control. Um, but, but really, in, in almost the, the, the focus has been on and continues to be on uh, having a, a strong degree of, of flow permeability. Let, let me add one more thing, is that the dynamic configuration store, while we're definitely uh, pursuing it with fervor, and we want to be able to provide it, um, is still at least um, my and others' opinion uh, that, that the abstractions are ultimately still the best approach, uh, and therefore the, on us, uh, the use of the Yang tools, or the, the Yang models themselves, should really still continue to be confined behind the barrier of the drivers and, uh, and abstractions that the drivers provided. And this approach is actually very congruent with what Google is doing. Uh, you can actually watch the webinar which I just gave last week with Anis Shade from Google, who's a network uh, um, architect at Google. Um, the Google's approach is very, very congruent with what Onos is using. They're trying to keep Yang as buried as possible um, and away from applications. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so it's almost one o'clock, so also we have to take a photo and also forget to have a lunch. So maybe it's, if you don't have any uh, uh, questions, then maybe it's time to wrap up. Do you have any final words? No? Okay. Okay, no. Again, Thank you for the good questions, and again, I would like to encourage everybody to encourage, um, I would like to encourage everybody <laughs> to participate with the uh, with, uh, with the Honors TST. Uh, we have weekly meetings. Um, uh, which we hold with some degree of regularity. Sometimes the, the, the meetings get interrupted or postponed because of um, other events or other things happening like releases. But too often they get uh, postponed due to lack of topics. And so uh, we're very open to moving those to, to time zones which are uh, friendly to, to, to you know, either Korea or European time zones. And so I would encourage the everybody here to, to participate in those meetings and to supply topics, bring discussion to TST, or bring concerns to TST. Um, so, again, thank you for the good questions. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.